All right. Well, welcome everyone to the first PFCC Partners Community of Practice Workshop of 2024. Um, thank you all for kicking off the new year with us. Um, we just recently had our executive retreat and are really thrilled to bring more energy to the work that we're doing. So wanted to do that today with all of you. Um, so please reciprocate that energy back to us. Um, and as we get started, would love to just see who is joining us today. So if you wouldn't mind using the chat, um, chatting in your name, um, uh, what organization you're from, and would love to hear um, some of your goals for 2024, the new year, as I know we're rounding out the first month, but we still have a whole year ahead of us. Um, and we're asking that because today um, you are joined by Libby Hoy, founder and CEO, and myself, I'm Lindsay Galley, uh, Vice President of Programs at PFCC Partners. And we are going to do um, a quick reflection of 2023. Um, we did a lot of listening last year. Libby and I were just adding up, you know, how many <laughs> listening sessions we did and conversations we had with patients, family caregivers, um, and, you know, healthcare leadership and um, other healthcare stakeholders. So uh, we learned a lot last year. So want to reflect a little bit, but um, even more importantly, look forward to um, share how we will use what we learned to build, you know, uh, lasting relationships and um, continued partnerships throughout the new year. Um, so very excited to have you all um, join us and learn along with us today. Thank you everyone for um, chatting in lots, lots of great goals specific to patient family engagement as well. I love to see that for 2024. Well, I'm excited to read through those a little bit more um, after today's session, but thank you all for introducing yourself and sharing. Um, and at this time, I am going to pass it off to Libby Hoy, founder and CEO of PFCC Partners, to kick us off with um, just a reminder of who we are and what we do here. Libby? Thank you, Lindsay. And thanks to everybody for taking some time on your Friday afternoon to join us. I'm jealous of our friends from the Eastern time zone because you're a lot closer to the weekend than I am. But um, <clears throat> nevertheless, very happy to have you join us today. Um, yeah, as Lindsay said, we just finished our, our executive retreat and really wanted to focus on where we're headed, what we've learned, and, and where we're going. Um, I, I was, um, again, awed by the fact that uh, MLK weekend happens to be the, the, the Tuesday after MLK weekend. It happens to be the anniversary of when I started PFCC Partners. And so um, we are now 14 years old, which seems so impossible to believe and have come a long way since um, my kitchen table uh, where when I said we, I was being facetious because it was really just me talking to myself. Um, but now I'm surrounded by such an innovative and inspiring team. Um, our mission, vision and values have not changed. Um, we still really have a vision to transform the health system through partnership with patients, family caregivers, and most importantly, communities as well. Our values haven't changed, but we've grown into them much, much more. I will say that uh, when I was drafting those, these were the values that were really important to me early on, but now we've been really challenged to see how do you put inclusion into practice? How do you collaborate You know, really effectively? Everybody throws the word around collaboration, but what does that really mean in your work? And so we've really grown into these values and really um, lived by them. On the next slide, um, we've got what we've got, <laughs> what we lovingly call the groovy slides. Um, we've grown up in our ability also to articulate what it is we exactly do. So the healthcare system, as we all know, is super complex, and the systems are difficult to navigate because there are so many systems. Right? There's the whole policy system. There's the payer system. There's the the health centers that system. There's the providers and um, all of those systems have to work together, but they have one continuous in, in common, and that is the patient that travels across all of those systems and is impacted by all of those systems. And so we get to see things 
that um, others that are working in the system may not always see. Um, and so what? how can we leverage that as, an, as a, another tool in the toolbox to create the changes and the transformation that we all wanna see? So the work of PFCC partners on the next slide is to open spaces in all that complexity and bring patient and family uh, caregivers, people with lived experience into those conversations, not just so that they can be engaged in their, their own healthcare, but that they can be engaged at the most formative stages of our healthcare system and, co and true co-design. So that's the work of PFCC partners. We open the space for people with lived experience to partner and inform the design of healthcare. And so with that in mind on the, on the next slide or the next click, then the PFA network, which we uh, uh, you'll hear more about in just a few minutes, those are the people that, that join us in this effort, our community. And in that community, we've got over a thousand people, um, people like myself who use our lived experience to um, engage with the healthcare system with the mutual goal of improving it, right? That's our North Star. Everybody's got that North Star. We all want to see improvement. And when we line up together under that North Star, it's amazing what we can do. On the next slide, I think we can keep going. So um, a couple of years ago, uh, along with everybody else in May 2020, I put out a statement to our community to address the um, the murder of George Floyd, and I, I made a commitment to our values, and I, I promoted our values again, and I got back from one of our um, board of directors a, an email that said, Libby, you sound tone deaf. You need to listen first, and after I got over the, the surprise, because I had the best of intentions. Most people, a lot of people do, most people do. And so, um, but I really took to heart the, the concept that we were jumping to solutioning before we were really understanding the problem on a very deep level. And so since that time, and particularly in 2023, we've really started to listen and listen with curiosity. Cultivating curiosity is a phrase we throw around the office um, very frequently. Um, at, at speaking with honesty and, and acting with integrity, we just love this quote because um, we really need to lean into the idea that, that the other person, the other community, the underrepresented voice has incredible amount of knowledge, experience, and expertise that can help us, that can aid us in that mutual goal of improving the healthcare system overall. And you know, this this quote reminds me of something I've really come to see recently in that people who are invisible in a space, they see a lot. They see a lot because nobody's worried about hiding anything from them because they don't even see them. And for a lot of our underrepresented communities, they see a lot because they're really largely unseen by the health system. And so the, the work of PFCC partners then is to continue to open those spaces, especially in those vulnerable communities to elevate the persons with lived experience so that we can really, really learn. All right, on the next slide then, um, so Lindsay mentioned it, we've been listening a lot. <laughs> we um, do listening sessions with all of our contractors really for the purpose of um, just understanding the breadth of the experience, whether it's related to reducing sepsis or uh, reducing readmissions. We have so much to learn if we just open the space to listen and ask some uh, prompting questions. But the, I often get asked, what's the difference between a listening session and a, a focus group? And the listening session goes broad. It goes very broad so that it's not about what I want to know more about X, Y, Z. So I'm going to ask about X, Y, Z. It's more a case of, I want to understand readmissions. So instead of focusing on the hospital discharge, you open up the idea of how, what is readmissions? And then you hear things like what's going on in the community. You get to know what's in the gaps. So the listening sessions are really broad. And then the focus groups are really a deep dive into a very specific topic. 
both are helpful. We like to use those in conjunction um, as well as adding in interviews as well so that we get a, a variety of opportunities for people, uh, for us to hear from people. So uh, listening sessions are big. Uh, Lindsay and Naomi led the team in, uh, in the Inspire project to do some um, interviews. I'm sorry for the noise outside. Can you hear that? You're okay? Okay. Um, we do these community of practice workshops. In a, a, this is one of our main avenues to share with you all what we're hearing, what we learn. Um, and we'll do more of that during uh, 2024 and really invite you to help us um, understand how we can better move that information. We do um, coffee chats. Those are just open-ended. Anybody from the PFA network who wants to join us for coffee on a Friday morning or lunchtime at whatever it might be um, <clears throat> can come and talk about what was most important to them. And that's transitioned a little bit and will continue to transition in 2024, um, which I'll talk about in, in just a little bit, but another touch point for our patient family partners. Um, 24 patient family engagement for equity think tanks. Those are uh, quick sessions for peer learning for our hospital, healthcare staff, researchers, anybody who wants to join us to um, for that peer learning concept, right? We don't know everything, so we need to hear from other like-sized hospitals or uh, nursing homes or centers. And Lindsay does a great job of prompting with a little bit of content and then letting um, the organizations share how they're moving forward with patient and family engagement. 48 patient family partnership hub community conversations. So if you add those all up, we have at least one touch point a week for um, our to hear from our community. Um, most of those conversations are with patient family partners or people with lived experience. But also we want to hear from, from healthcare staff, from our research partners, our measure development partners on what it is they need to, to understand more deeply. So it sounds like, and you know, I was sharing this with a friend and she's like, oh my gosh, you talk a lot. Actually, we don't, that's the whole thing. It's just opening that space again to listen. So on the next slide, we'll go to what have we heard? What have we heard? And what have we learned about convening multi-stakeholder groups? Um, I think it's, we've learned a lot this year uh, in terms of how do we create agendas, infrastructure that um, to, to that uh, multi-stakeholders, and I'll give you an example, um, can come together in a safe zone. Everybody feels comfortable to, um, to contribute in a zone that is um, power leveled, right? That, that nobody has more power in the situation than another. Um, that is culturally responsive. That's tricky. There's a lot going on there. And so um, we haven't always gotten it right, but but I wanted to just share an example um, of a current project that we're smack dab in the middle of. Um, and on the next page, on the next slide, um, that's ICU communication. So this is a uh, PCORI engagement award um, that we are partnering with uh, Dr. Dong Chang from um, LA County DHS, uh, Department of Health Services and um, <clears throat> Dr. Glenna Chang from Kaiser Permanente South Bay. And the three of us are really diving into wanting to understand how can we improve communications between clinicians in the ICU, which Drs. Chang and Chang are, and patient and family partners. So we've brought this community together and we're really challenged to build a project that would meet all of our goals in, in creating that safe space for all stakeholders to contribute. And so what we came up with um, on the next slide, we can go to, to the next slide. This was our in-person convening. Actually, Lindsay, would you go to the next slide and come back to this one? So what we did in the early stages of the project is we met with all the, the stakeholders. We had clinicians, we had hospital administrative, we had um, health researchers, we had patients and families, of course. And what we did in the first few meetings is do some analysis of, you know, on, with a with a power level set. We know that every person in that in that meeting has something to contribute. They have knowledge. They have expertise. They have skills. 
everyone, whether you have letters after your name or you're a patient and a family caregiver. So we designed this project so that we could really identify how those skills could come together. So what we heard from some of the clinicians is they're unsure how to create plain language, how to speak to people with that. We heard from patients and families, we know plain language, we know what we understand, we can help you with that. And so building on this concept, we then, um, then if you could go back to the other slide, Lindsay, <laughs> um, we can then bring everybody together in an in-person event and share those. So this was the skills exchange. We were exchanging skills, patients and families helping the clinicians and researchers move forward in their skill set, uh, clinicians and researchers helping patients and families to understand where they can be a, a partner in uh, improving um, ICU communication. I, I maybe forgot to mention, we're really focused on a, uh, a previous intervention that Dr. Chang uh, developed called a time-limited trial. And so we're really focused on the communication about potentially non-beneficial treatments in the ICU. Um, I know we hear from a lot of patient and family partners that, you know, my mom didn't want that and yet it happened. Why did it happen? They didn't understand, you know, we, all this miscommunication. So that's the, the, the real focus point. And so what then are um, we going to do with all this information, all the skills that we exchanged? Well, out of this convening, we developed a, um, a list of research priorities that would feed future research so that we can improve um, not only communication, but the, the interventions that are, are to uh, help us with that improved communication. So on the next slide, how are we moving that learning into action. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making you jump all around. Um, how are we moving that information into action? We're creating that actionable agenda, certainly for research. We want to share the outcomes. We want to share what we learned, what the uh, clinicians learned, what the patients and families learned, what the researchers learned. We want to move that all out so that other people can use this kind of model to build the own, their own uh, multi-stakeholder communities. Um, one thing that we didn't do so great at is relationship building with our patient family partners in that, in that particular project. We didn't do enough. We didn't do enough outreach. And as such, we had some drop off and we had some people that, um, just divested, I will say in, um, in some regard, because they didn't really understand the whole process. Um, so we have more to do there. We have, uh, Going forward in 2024, in the final year of the project, we, we intend to create additional, very inclusive opportunities um, to ensure that we're what we're hearing from our patient family partners is really representative um, of LA County. And um, so, it everything that we hear moves into some action, some way of developing and doing something um, differently to strengthen those partnerships. All right. Another hot topic that we've been talking to a lot of people about is social uh, drivers of health. Those items of food security, housing security, those items that we know influence a person's um, health and, and well-being. And if we're really going to get to population of health, health, if we're really going to improve the health of our communities, we really have to uh, understand what it is that's going on in those communities. And so um, we've been talking with a lot of, of hospital and healthcare staff um, through our HQIC program that are deeply concerned about um, screening people for social drivers of health. That's a deeply personal screen, right? And so how do they set the context um, of a, a, a safe space for people to give them that information? And, and is it ethical to ask for that information if they don't have resources to provide if someone screens positive? So Interestingly, we then spoke with patient family partners about SDOH screening. And what we heard is the exact same worry. I don't want to screen and be, you know, come up positive and then just have the person stare at me. That would be really humiliating. So isn't that interesting that we have this same North Star 
for uh, what is most concerning about us. So after we heard that, we're like, geez, you know, with the screening programs, I wonder if they're developed with the community um, at the table designing the screening program, how would that change? And so how would that, how might that change? How might that strengthen the screening process? Well, if you have a patient family partner at the table and you're using the data to identify the highest community needs, that's the place we start, right? Look at the data. You can validate the data with lived experience. And we just heard a great example from Gunnison Valley in um, Colorado. They looked at their patient experience information and they saw that there was, uh, and then they stratified it. And they saw that the uh, second language learners and specifically a dialect of Spanish were, were rated rating uh, communication extremely lowly. So they went out and talked to that community. They validated the data with lived experience. Then uh, organizations are able to learn about community resources as they're talking with people in the community um, and, and learn from the people who are accessing them, which ones are really valuable. Um, the PFPs can inform community messaging, a critical component of, of social drivers of health screening, a critical component. We've heard this over in a million different ways, but here's one example. Patients and families who are being screened are nervous about that screening. Where is that information going? How is it gonna be used? We will have stronger screening programs if we communicate where that information is going, that it's being used to understand the needs in an effort to, to then meet those needs. And I, so I think it's essential for people from the community to inform community messaging, because what do we know? We know that the same, I, I spoke with a really brilliant woman from Colorado the other day, and she said, you know, we're all dealing with the same problems, but they all have different context and we have to respect that local context. Engaging patient family partners is a way to do that. What happens if we don't? What if we develop a great screening program just within the, the hospital staff or the outpatient staff? How, what if we develop this really, this program we think is brilliant and we develop the public messaging. This is what we want you to know. And then you implement the program. What's the risk there, right? You can see that if you engage the community in developing that program with you, they are then your partner for implementation as opposed to something they're doing to your community, you're doing truly with your community. And by the way, kind of alleviate some of that heavy burden all of our healthcare uh, systems are, are really feeling right now. All right. I think I'm gonna stop talking now, Lindsay, and put, send it over to you. And I'm gonna go off screen for just a minute to grab a glass of water, but I'm not leaving you any of it, any of you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Libby. <clears throat> so um, kind of as a an add-on to what Libby was just talking about with the SDOE screening and all of the learning that we did um, within some of our partnerships, we took this conversation on the road. Um, and yes, Karen, you're absolutely right. This um, entire conversation really stemmed from CMS's um, requirements around SDOH screening for hospitals um, and now ambulatory um, centers as well. Um, so we we took this conversation on the road and it actually started um, before November, but this is where I'm going to focus. It started in uh, May at the PFCC conference um, that we hosted along with some of our partners um, where we did a challenge cafe with participants there and participants range from uh, people with lived experience, um, advocates, um, a lot of really local uh, Los Angeles County um, staff from Department of Health Services who are great partners of ours, um, administrative, you know, frontline staff. Um, and we all came together just to talk about all of the challenges that there were around the social drivers of health screening and developing programs that are effective um, and, you know, work really well for everyone. Um, so we gathered all of the challenges there and we brought those challenges to the putting care at the center um, conference uh, put on by Camden Coalition in November of this year. And so we took all of those challenges and we we had an, another 
really incredible group of people um, participate in a 90 minute um, knowledge cafe where we address those challenges. Um, we had uh, sticky notes all, all around the room, the big flip charts where we had groups of, um, you know, five to 10 people who were their sole focus for 10 minutes was um, addressing as many solutions as they can to the challenges that um, were brought from that PFCC conference. So they had 10 minutes to do all of that. And then they switched to another challenge and had 10 minutes to um, share all of their ideas on that one as well. Um, we had about uh, 50 plus participants at this Knowledge Cafe. And um, in a quick show of hands of who's who and who's in the room, we had a very broad, diverse group of people. We had healthcare leadership, we had quality improvement professionals, we had uh, folks in research. We of course had people with lived experience, um, community organizations, clinical staff. Um, and the one option that we didn't have was community health workers. And we ended up having two to three community health workers um, who also participated in this knowledge cafe. Um, and they brought in such a rich um, experience and a new perspective to uh, this conversation. Um, so here are the overall themes from the Knowledge Cafe. So we had five challenges that we brought um, from the PFCC Conference Challenge Cafe, which was um, one, aligning with community organizations to better meet uh, patient social needs. What does that look like? Um, the, the education for healthcare staff. So what does healthcare staff need to um, know to follow through with an inclusive social drivers of health screening program? Um, inclusivity was a big challenge as well. Um, what does inclusivity look like when it comes to um, these screenings? Um, as Libby had mentioned, you know, how can people with lived experiences be engaged with um, co-designing these programs. Um, and then finally, this topic has come up a lot in a lot of our work, but what does a trustworthy organization look like? So you can see some of the overall themes here. I'm not going to read each one, but I've had it up long enough. So maybe you can <laughs> grab some of those big ideas. We will be um, sharing a, uh, a more detailed report of everything that we learned um, and you will have access to see, you know, every response we got um, to each one of these questions. But I did want to just really focus on the top three themes that we heard through this Knowledge Cafe. Um, so the first, of course, <laughs> and we didn't just hear this from the community health workers that were there, we heard it from others who see the value in the role of community health workers. So partner with um, community health workers or pomatoras, um, you know, community health navigators. Um, uh, so we have more learning to do about what that role is. Um, and then creating out of the box um, partnerships and collaborating um, in ways that healthcare organizations haven't before. So, you know, what would it look like if a hospital created a really strong connection with a community-based organization that's addressing food insecurity? Um, how can they share resources and information um, all in support of their patients and family caregivers um, and the community as a whole? Um, and then finally, education for both healthcare organizations and the community um, on, you know, as Libby was sharing earlier, what is the purpose of the social drivers of health screening? What's being done with the information? Um, all of those um, questions that we all have, we all need education <laughs> about it so we can move forward and be able to implement these social drivers of health screening programs in a way that you know meets the needs of the healthcare organization, but also doesn't put patients and their family caregivers in um, a, a truly vulnerable space. And so in moving learning, all that learning into action, some things that we will be doing as we move forward into the new year is one, share um, what we have learned um, to support um, the healthcare organizations uh, that we are partnered with, 
um, to engage patients and family caregivers in the process of developing inclusive um, SDOH screening programs. Um, like I said, we have a lot more learning to do. Um, we've already done a lot of learning around um, the role of community health workers and promotoras, but specifically where is their role in, um, you know, mm -hmm. supporting community education around social drivers of health. Um, uh, so that is one, just more learning. I don't, I think we're on a consistent learning journey always. <laughs> um, and then finally promote, um, uh, what we know about social drivers of health screening processes and how it's used and why it's important to the PFA network, because we know patients and family caregivers, um, you know, need that information. So when they go to their next appointment or if they have a hospital stay and they're being asked these questions, they have some familiarity with that. So um, taking on um, some of that um, knowledge sharing um, around the social drivers uh, screening programs as well. All right. Well, Libby, it sounds easy uh -huh. <laughs> to bring people together and have really powerful, meaningful um, conversations, but you and I both know that it does come with its own set of challenges. So right now we're going to show you our dirty dishes. <laughs> <laughs> um so Libby, I think you had mentioned really quickly when talking about the um, ICU communications, one of the challenges was um, that consistency to build relationships with patient family partners um, within that project. So just wanted to see if you wanted to touch on that a little bit more. Um, it's a big Absolutely. challenge. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, yeah, we've we've had some spectacular fails, and we at PFCC Partners really like to celebrate our failures because that that's the way we learn and grow and and develop. And we're pretty humble in that process. Uh, many of you may know that in my next life, I will start Failure University because I just so strongly believe in the concept. <laughs> but our board didn't go for the acronym FU, so um, that will have to wait. But. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, one of the facil facilitation fails that I like mentioned in ICU is that that you really do need to build uh, some relationship, build some um, capacity. And, and Lindsay mentioned a trustworthy organization. What is a trustworthy organization? From the reading I've done in the capacity that we as a small team have, the first thing we can do is be consistent, is do what we say, say what we do and be consistent in that. If people uh, can depend on you, can feel that comfort level with you, then they will show up and they will invest. And we've seen that over and over. So um, yes, definitely in the in the ICU communications project, we definitely needed to strengthen, um, strengthen that, that facilitation. I think the other um, thing I, I maybe also referenced a little bit, that's another failure of facilitation is moving to solutioning too quickly. Particularly when you're talking with people with lived experience, you really need to understand the problem first from the perspective of, of the person with lived experience, because sometimes that gives you um, clues that help you to know you're solving the right problem. So maybe your, your hospital is uh, working on readmissions and your hospital sees an opportunity um, to improve communication at discharge, right? They look at the data and that's what it says. So we're gonna design a new discharge process. That's all well and good, but when you talk with patients and families, you might find out that it's not the information, it's not the way that it's written, it's the timing the information's given. But if you don't open space enough for people to really share with you their perspective of a problem before you move to solutioning, you really risk solving the wrong problem. So, and nobody has time for that or resources. <laughs> so um, those are a couple of, of my personal facilitation fails. Happy to share many, many more. <laughs> when you do that many listening sessions, you come up short quite a few times, but uh, grace and patience and a wonderful community. So we get through it. Absolutely. What about you, Lindsay? You've, um, I'm not the only one hanging out on a line sometimes. No. <laughs> I've done a lot of listening myself this past year and have dealt with a lot of silence. Um, 
which is so hard. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has experienced that being a facilitator, but when you ask a question and there is crickets and then you sing happy birthday to yourself in your head and still <laughs> crickets. So, um, yeah, that was one of the things that I was, um, challenged with this year and found myself getting a little bit frustrated with. And in looking back, so Libby, you gave me a lot of credit for, you know, setting up for these, um, conversations in the, in the think tank. So providing context and, um, content and things that we know. Um, and I realized that taking too much time to get to the discussion or the conversation, you're going to lose folks. So, um, you know, I think there's really a balance between, you know, providing a little bit of context that will help just level set everyone to say, here is the conversation that we're all showing up for, um, then providing too much and losing folks, um, uh, within that. Cause I think I, I've, I've done a lot of context sharing. It's something that I'm really comfortable with. You know, I like to talk to, um, and I get a little too comfortable, um, in providing what I know instead of, you know, kicking off with, um, a question, even if it's not related to the topic, but kicking off with a fun question, like we did today with, um, everyone sharing their goal for 2024, um, you know, or with a poll. Um, I've also, kind of ask too many questions all at once. So um, I think having some focus when you go into these collaborative discussions, you know, what's that one, one <clears throat> question that we all want to work together on and brainstorm. So yeah, that's my going into 2024, just more focus. <laughs> <laughs> You're very that curious. Silence. <laughs> that silence is tough. <laughs> That's that's Libby's training technique. <laughs> Sing happy birthday yep. twice in your head, <laughs> then you can talk again. <laughs> yeah. It helps, but it. it's so true. I mean, we find that all the time. Everybody has a different tempo to um, you know, absorbing information. So you really gotta leave that space for folks. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Shall we move on? We shall. Okay. Yeah, they network. Libby, what's been going on in 2023? Oh my gosh, so much. So much. So much. And we've really, I think, um, I'm excited about 2023 and even more so about 2024. Um, at the beginning of 2023, we really took those lessons from our DEI Leadership Council and others to um, encourage us to focus on inclusion. And by focusing on inclusion, we get to diversity. But rather than creating a list of all the, all the different people we want represented, we focused on just create events and opportunities that are inclusive, that have language translation, that have uh, uh, closed captioning for anybody who needs that, that has, uh, um, we've experimented with um, vision support, um, have them at different times of the day, have different uh, messengers that can bring people in that um, are more inclusive. And so by really focusing on that, we've really expanded. I think at the beginning of um, 2023, we had about 600 um, folks in our larger listserv. So our larger, um, you know, that gets all of our uh, emails and our invitations and whatnot. There's um, about 600. We now have over a thousand. So that is a huge amount of growth in one year. And then, um, Importantly, the number you see on the screen, 134. We had 134 people who completed our membership survey. And the membership survey is, there's no charge for membership. None of our uh, activities are, you know, have a fee associated or whatnot. And so um, what the people give us in their membership survey is their passions. What are they passionate about? What a little bit about their lived experience to say, you know, I'm passionate about reducing sepsis because my daughter experienced sepsis. That's that's really important for us to know so that we can help, um, you know, connect them to those opportunities. So we went from 134 to 325 and in just one year, um, 325 people engaging that are deeply passionate about partnering in the health system. That is 
it just blows my mind. I'm so excited about that. Um, we welcome them all. And um, we, of course, I, you know, didn't think of it, but going back to our DEI Leadership Council said, you need to stratify that information. You need to know who you've brought in and where you've been successful. And um, absolutely, we will go back and do that. But um, pretty exciting. You can see from the heat map, we've got pretty good um, coverage across the country. We've still got to find some friends in the Dakotas. But <laughs> other than that, I think we're we're doing pretty well. So, and I should mention all of those are great friends and, and colleagues from the PFA network in those pictures. Wait, you know what? Go back because I want to brag about Maria. So Maria is new to our PFA network and um, represents one of those 325. Um, Maria is monolingual Spanish, and she joined our uh, LA County DHS hub, and through that, felt empowered um, that her voice was really important. And it wasn't until maybe six months after knowing her that she told us she was a promotorist. And we, so we, she came to the office so graciously, sat down with LA County DHS leadership and and ourselves, and told us about what that experience was about, and so empowered. That's a picture of her speaking to uh, a room full of about uh, 300 uh, healthcare leaders from L LA County DHS, sharing her story about what her community needs. And those are that was a leadership conference. I mean, I was intimidated. She just nailed it and, and was so uh, able to connect with the, the participants that they uh, are all in for engaging patients and families across all activities of LA County DHS. Um, so, and you know, the other two pictures, <laughs> Connie, <laughs> always smiling, um, and some of the work that our patient family partners are doing. I think 3M owes us a lot of uh, a lot because we spend a lot on sticky notes. So that's a little bit about who's in the network. So one of the things that we think is really important is evaluating. And our evaluations are not science-based or rigorous enough for any of that. We really want to evaluate because we want to continue to improve our practices. And so we evaluate both the patient family partner who's gotten engaged and the healthcare system or staff member who's engaged them with a mirrored uh, five item um, quick evaluation. And so we, we put that evaluation into a new system the last quarter of uh, 2023. And this is, this is the ratings that we got. And so this tells us that we have more to do to help the healthcare partners and patient family co partner come together to um, work collaboratively. More of the mechanisms of how that works, uh, we need to, to support healthcare providers a little bit more in that way. Um, we've got some more room to provide context and preparation for patient family partners. But overall, we were pretty pleased with this. And um, my brother would be so proud as a businessman. He was always telling me about the net promoter score, which I didn't understand at all, but um, we put it in there anyway. Would you recommend the PFA network? The fact that both healthcare partners and patient family partners would recommend us 100%. That's, you know, it's a small sample, I'll admit, but I'll take it. I think that that indicates that um, we're on to something. We're on to uh, building that infrastructure for positive partnership. Um, and then again, we had 55 hours of effort again just in the last quarter from our patient family partner, uh, patient family advisory network members. So uh, that's 55 hours of lived experience informing um, healthcare activities. I think that's pretty cool. All right. So Every great dream begins with a dreamer. And I've certainly been accused of being that. <laughs> um, but I, I really want to invite all of you into this um, conversation as well, in terms of helping us to understand how can we share what we hear? We listen so much. How can we share what we hear with our, our partners in our health systems, our partners in research, um, we do, I think we do a pretty decent job of sharing what we learn back with our PFA network members, um, but also open to hearing uh, ideas around that as well. So on the next slide, is, is this you, Lindsay? 
This is me. I am going to open a poll um, because, you know, what we have shared here today has been a tidbit of what we have learned in the last year. And we have a lot more to share. <laughs> and there's already a lot that uh, we have shared in various ways, um, but would love to just ask directly from, you know, our partners and collaborators, what is the best way to share um, what we have learned in the past and what we will continue to learn as we move forward. So I'm going to launch um, a quick poll. So um, please just take a moment, you know, is it a white paper, a short three minute video? Um, you know, we do email blasts that have information about our projects. Um, if you're on social media, is that a good way to get you information? Or if you have other ideas, I please welcome you to um, chat those in as well. I'll leave that open for about 30 more seconds. You know what, while people answer that one, I'm gonna go back to, uh, was it Suzanne's question in the chat yes. about the environmental scan? So um, Suzanne, I'm not, I would love to hear more about what you're asking because I'm not quite sure. Um, and I want to be responsive. So if you want to come off mute, I'm happy to hear your question. Um, just in the environmental scanning, how did you learn what questions to ask within the environment that matters equally, I suppose, with the patient family partners along with the healthcare professionals? to find alignment there, just to, so the output of that environment's, environmental scan had the most meaningful information to then take action. So everything that we learned about what skills and what questions we needed to be asking came from the community. So the hmm. starting point was, you know, what do you see as your strengths, your, um, and where do you see your gaps? What do you want to learn? What do you need to learn? So we we ask, and that's where our questions came from. Does that answer your question? Yes, because I'm thinking, you know, or do you get it more from um, uh, directional questions to ask? So what I just heard, which makes the most sense, you kind of, you um, learned what questions to ask from being in the community. And then from that, you ask those questions instead of just this, I'm trying to get out of thinking about where, I just, to ask the right questions to get the best information you can take action on. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't know if you can get that best from um, articles or other assessments are out there because they can be so vast where you're not really getting the information that is helpful. <laughs> And yeah, you're so right. And, and that's, um, you know, it's always great to, you know, do the, the environmental scan and read what you can to influence, but really the method of, you know, asking, uh, opening the space. And I would say that's what we do is open the space for people to tell us what they need and what they're, um, struggling with and where the, where they see gaps. Um, to ask those kind of open-ended questions gives you more of the information that's relevant in the context that you're asking it. So I can read all those articles, but I don't know how uh, people in LA County, um, especially in our underrepresented neighborhoods, I don't know how they're experiencing ICU. And I, it's really hard to find an academic paper that's done uh, that first person you know, connection. Um, Plus, I just like talking to people <laughs> or listening to people. So asking that question in the context that you're working gives you, I think, more relevant information to that population. Does that make sense? That makes absolute perfect sense. And I think no matter what an article, you can't necessarily say it's current and today. And the only way you're going to get more relevant um, conversation pieces to really find solutions is to work with the communities, talk to the people, and just that's part of it, right? And that's building those partnerships as well. So yeah, you answered that perfectly. Thank you. I love the way you're thinking. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. How did yeah. our poll look? Um, it looks like um, a majority, but it's pretty spread out across the board, but 
uh, prefer those short videos. So we've shared a few mm -hmm. in the past to highlight some of the tools that we have developed. Um, and those are our most popular, you know, you could get it in a quick <laughs> three minutes, um, and know how, how to use the tool, what it's for. Um, so that is, uh, really helpful. And I'm glad to see that folks still appreciate, you know, the, the email blast with the information that we send out. So, um, that, that is extremely helpful. So thank you so much. Sorry, I was just reading Roger's comment. Um, Roger, did you want to expand on that at all? Hey, Libby, hey, yo. Um, so, you know, the, the whole patient family council, uh, advisory council move is just, you know, starting up in here in Iowa. There's a lot of people that are, you know, still uh, in the dark about what, what goes on and, and how important it is to get involved. And and I've been trying to you know reach out to people and say hey we got this this PFACC partners and the and mm -hmm. it's you know people are, are just saying oh what's this how uh so it's like I think we need to um to spread the word everybody that's on the call we need to spread the word and you know reach out and let people know that there is agencies out here and there are people out here that are willing to get involved and be part of it so. Um, so my my suggestion is to do some good marketing, and also, you know, for um for us members is to spread the word, and um maybe uh you know give people our the email or the um our, our stuff so that they can get involved also. So just a suggestion. Yeah, that's awesome, Roger. Thank you so much. And I know you're always such a great ambassador of the organization and, and bringing people in. Um, I And I think that is an important piece is it continuing to outreach. But I think it's not our voices. It's the voices of our community that can really carry the message forward. So um, more to come on that, certainly. So what else are we learning from the moving into action from the, the PFA network? Um, that we need to focus on patient family engagement within improvement priorities, that there's a huge opportunity to embed what we call the funfetti approach um, in quality improvement across health systems, across federal partnerships, across every place, everywhere that patient quality and safety is attempting to be improved, we need to integrate patient and family perspective into those priorities. So it's a little bit of a different shift of you know, convening a patient family advisory council and saying, hey, what do you think we should work on? Really want to avoid that. What we want to do is feed the priorities, the critical quality and safety priorities that we have in this country with the perspective of patients and families, people with lived experience. Um, and for any of you who are new into patient family engagement, let me just say, when you say in the best of intention, of course, but when you bring a group of patients and family community members in and say, tell us what we should work on, you're immediately setting both you and your partners up for discord and disjointed um, expectations because they may want a new outpatient uh, <laughs> surgery center and you don't have the funding to do that. Now you've just done this and it's just a really tough place to start from. So I really encourage, we encourage you to think about what are those patient safety and quality goals within the organization that you can bring patients and families into. Um, Lindsay and Naomi and I are having a great time revising the gateways to patient family partnership programs um, to embed more uh, inclusivity um, to embed more um, opportunities in the health system in the way that it exists today. Um, I wrote the Gateways program about 10 years ago and it, it has needed some updating. So looking forward to completing that revision um, to make it more meaningful and usable in the current environment. Um, more skills development. Uh, focused on behind the scenes of patient family engagement. So we asked our advisors, what is it we need to know as a community to strengthen our own partnership skills? And so we'll be bringing more of that forward. Um, gain deeper knowledge and connections locally. We're always looking to do that in all of the areas that we're um, uh, serving contractors in. 
And then um, highlight strategies for engagement on future community of practice. So in 2024, you will see that these Friday meetings will be very focused on the nuts and bolts of partnership with people with lived experience. Um, I think it's a really important time to, again, engage people with lived experience into quality and safety um, programs. There's many, many different ways to engage people, but um, we really want to bring forward some of those best practices that will really set both the organizations and our patient family partners up for success. Um, there was something else I wanted to mention. Oh, as part of asking our uh, PFA network members about what more we need to know about, we've developed this um, program of special focus coffee chats. And that's really about populations and people within our community sharing what is it like like we had anthony come <coughs> excuse me in november and share his perspective of what it's like to be a, a latino in the health system and what are those unique challenges so the more that we know about um unique populations the better we can be representative so we'll be rolling out many more topic areas um in in that way so uh, I think we have like two minutes, <laughs> but yeah. if we have any questions or uh, thoughts, challenges. Hi, Karen. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, great conference and talking about um, the uh, determinants of health. I'm on their committee with Yale and the, you know those metrics are going forward, but I look at it both as you know, the consumer wanting to see those metrics, the patient and having to give that information. And as a hospital, how do I put that information in? And is it going to be purely a click box? I checked it. Or do I have to check it and do something else? I'm looking at the revenue and the resources available for hospitals to do it. It's a great initiative. And then I think of it as a patient. And one of the things we talked about is patient privacy. Because you don't want a gaggle of people there when they're sharing this very personal information. And you provided some very good insights. And the other thing that triggered my memory, you know, or my thought process, is the EMR. And we had paper records. We knew what was in the paper record. I'm an old nurse. Been a nurse a long time. Now we have the EMR. And a patient may be very comfortable sharing that information with their primary care pr practitioner or their con specialty consultant. Well, once it gets in the EMR, everybody gets to see it. And I don't think patients understand that. And I think it's it's very sensitive information when you say, I don't have enough access to food. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's a huge topic. It's a great topic, but it needs to be refined more for the healthcare system, but also for the patients and the family. That's why we think it's so critical that we engage people with lived experience, patients, family caregivers, community members into developing those screening programs. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. Thank Very you. Very good. Yeah. All right. I know we are right at one o'clock um, and don't want to keep anyone. So at this time, we'll say thank you all so much for um, joining us. If you do have additional questions, we can stay on for another minute or two. Uh, but for those who need to hop off, thank you so much for joining the first uh, Community of Practice of Workshop of 2024. We are so excited to bring you uh, more really, really valuable content and information all throughout this year. Um, so we'll see you next month. Um, we'll send out this recording and um, other resources and an email follow up to those who registered. Um, and please reach out if you have any uh, questions or requests. But again, we'll stay on for just another minute or two if there is anything else. So thank you. I have a question for you. Okay. <laughs> Hello, my, name, my name is Bryce, and I work at Fox Chase Cancer Center here in Philadelphia. Hi, uh, Bryce. How are you? Good, how are uh, you? So I'm great. I was invited to attend this uh, presentation uh, by my VP, and okay. I support the patient experience. I'm actually